Hello, hello, hello. It's just now 7 p.m. on Wednesday, October the 18th. And I want to welcome you all again to the fourth annual UCSB Natural Reserve System Fall Seminar Series. My name is Andrew Brooks, and I'll be both your moderator and the host for tonight's presentations. I want to encourage everyone to join us each Wednesday night at 7 p.m. beginning tonight and for the next four weeks as we virtually visit one of the UCSB Natural Reserves and showcase some of the truly incredible research and other activities taking place there. Before I kick off tonight's program, I would like to briefly go through a little bit of housekeeping. The presentation portion of tonight's webinar will last approximately 45 to 50 minutes. We've set aside the remaining 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentations for any questions that you all might have for either Madison Hurd, our presenter, or myself. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little button labeled Q&A. You can click on that button and then type your questions into the text window. I'll be monitoring the questions during Madison's presentation, so please feel free to type in your questions at any time. With that sorted, I'd like to begin by giving you all a brief introduction to the Carpentry Salt Marsh Reserve, and then I'll introduce tonight's speaker, Madison Hurd. So I'd like to begin by giving you all a brief introduction to the Carpentry Salt Marsh Reserve. The Carpentry Salt Marsh Reserve is a member of the University of California's Natural Reserve System, or the UCNRS. And really, our mission is has three parts. It's to contribute to the understanding and wise stewardship of the earth and its natural systems by supporting university level teaching, research, and public service at protected natural areas throughout California. The UCNRS was established in 1965, and it represents a library of ecosystems. There are now 41 reserves located throughout the state of California. And in fact, the UCNRS is the largest university managed system of ecological reserves in the world. Focusing just on the Carpinteria Salt Marsh Reserve, I first would like to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities in this region and recognize that the Carpinteria Salt Marsh Reserve is located on the homeland of the coastal band of the Chumash people. The Carpinteria Salt Marsh Reserve was added to the UCNRS in 1977 as the 23rd UCNRS Reserves. The reserve is located west of the city of Carpinteria, about 12 miles east of Santa Barbara and 84 miles north of Los Angeles. The reserve itself is a 120 acre portion of the larger 230 acre Carpinteria salt marsh. And if you look at the photo there on the right hand side, the area shaded in green is that portion of the Carpinteria salt marsh that constitutes the reserve. The Carpinteria salt marsh itself is an estuarine tidally influenced coastal salt marsh, or in plain English, it's a coastal wetland. Now, unfortunately, California leads the nation in wetland loss. Estimates of US wetland loss over the past 250 years exceed 50%, but the situation is actually much worse in California. California has experienced losses as great as 95%, especially in Southern California. The Carpinteria Salt Marsh Reserve was added to the UCNRS to protect one of the last remaining coastal salt marshes in Southern California. Now, what do wetlands do and why are they important? Well, they provide both flood control and erosion control. On the left, the upper left is a photo of the Carpinteria Salt Marsh during the December 2020 king tides. These are the abnormally high tides that we get twice a year in conjunction with the winter and summer solstice. And as you can see, the entire marsh is flooded. In the upper center, there is a photo of large waves breaking along the Carpinteria salt marsh. And so the salt marsh actually prevents those waves from breaking on the shoreline and endangering the homes and businesses that are there on the northern border of the marsh. Coastal salt marshes typically have large populations of marine algae, and these marine algae can remove excess nutrients from the water before that water exits the marsh out onto the coast and potentially negatively impacts coastal kelp beds. In the lower left, I've shown just three of the many species of birds that can be seen in the marsh. Coastal salt marshes support incredibly high levels of biodiversity, I've shown three species there. In the upper left is Belding Savannah Sparrow. In the upper right is our resident osprey with a fish. And in the lower 
photo, you can see uh, a small group of American white pelicans, a relatively rare visitor to the marsh. Coastal salt marshes act as carbon sinks. So salt marsh soil can store a large amount of carbon, and this is become, becoming increasingly important as the levels of carbon dioxide continue to increase in the atmosphere. And finally, just natural aesthetics. In the lower right, you see a photo taken by Matt Perko of the Carpegaria Salt Marsh at sunset, and they're just amazingly beautiful places to visit. Now, I mentioned a little bit about the flora and fauna. The Carpegaria Salt Marsh Reserve is home to over 250 species of plants. I've shown three here, salt marsh bird speak on the left, Ventura Marsh milk vetch in the center, and Coulter's Goldfield on the right. All three of those species are listed as either threatened or endangered. And in fact, the Ventura Marsh milk vetch was once thought to be extinct. The reserve hosts over 234 species of birds, including great blue heron, osprey, and belding savanna sparrows, and over 150 species of marine fishes and invertebrates, including native oysters, fiddler crabs, and leopard sharks. We recently had uh, a large school of leopard sharks, probably 75 to 100 individuals, that entered the marsh to spawn. Now, I mentioned that tripart mission of the UC NRS, research, teaching, and public outreach. And so I'd like to highlight some of the activities that have taken place in the reserve over the last several years in each of those three areas. So beginning with research, we've seen 36 peer-reviewed publications featuring the marsh since 2020, and these include eight master's theses or PhD dissertations. And tonight's Presenter Madison Hurd is actually going to discuss her master's research that she carried out um, within the Carpinteria Salt Marsh. The Carpinteria Salt Marsh Reserve serves as an important reference site for the restoration activities that are taking place in the San Diego Lagoon uh, to the south. And that project is associated with mitigation for the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. The reserve has become home to several groups. Uh, working in the area of remote sensing. You can see in the photograph there in the lower center, three students from Cal State Northridge, part of their CSUN drone team. Um, and they use drones to collect imagery, which is then used to construct 3D models of the marsh. And their work was actually vital um, in describing the large amounts of sediment that entered the marsh following the Thomas fire, and more recently, the sediment that flowed into the marsh following the extremely high amounts of rainfall that we experienced in 2022 and 2023. And lastly, the marsh is used uh, to conduct research related to coastal planning. So I've shown the cover of the Santa Barbara Area Coastal Ecosystem Vulnerability and Assessment Report. Um, this was a report that included the marsh uh, and was done at the request of local area governments so that they have a better idea of how sea level rise might impact um, coastal development. In terms of university level education, uh, we are seeing increases again in university classes using the marsh following COVID. I've listed just a few of the classes from UC Santa Barbara that use the reserve, everything from a course on the marine land interface to uh, a course for students from the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management, one of the professional schools here at UCSB, looking at coastal marine ecosystem processes, courses in invertebrate zoology, parasitology, higher invertebrate zoology, vertebrate ecology and evolution, as well as ecology and management of California wildlands. So everything from sort of standard biology, botany, zoology courses up to courses in public policy. We also have a large number of courses from UCLA, UC San Diego, some of the Cal States, Cal State Northridge, Channel Islands, and Monterey Bay, uh, Westmont College from here in Santa Barbara, California Lutheran College, and then several community colleges, Santa Barbara City College and Ventura Community College. Um, to support these education efforts, we've recently installed our new science education and outreach support shed. This is a facility that will be used uh, to house teaching materials that can be used to support university classes, but also K through 12 classes. 
and it will be outfitted with solar panels through a grant provided to us by the Green Initiative Fund here at Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara. And so we're very uh, grateful to them for that funding. I want to highlight uh, our public service activities, and this includes everything from providing a location for local artists and photographers to use. There on the left, you see a photograph of Whitney Brooks Abbott and one of her paintings, Outgoing Tide Salt Marsh, which features the Carpinteria Salt Marsh. Whitney was actually the uh, 2022 NRS Fall Seminar speaker who represented the Carpentry of Salt Marsh. And if you'd like to check out Whitney's presentation, um, you can do so on the UCSB NRS YouTube channel. The reserve hosts classes from local K through 12 schools, including the Dunn School, Laguna Blanca School, Kate School, and our neighboring Aliso Elementary School. And we also provide uh, scientific expertise when we can. Um, I'm a member of the City of Carpentaria Harbor Steel Advisory Committee. Um, trying to explain uh, the decreasing abundance of harbor seals there on Carpentria area beaches. In terms of public service, I really want to highlight the reserve's long-term avian monitoring program. This is a 100% community-based participatory project. What that means is 100% of the people involved in the project are community members. They are not researchers from the university. And through their efforts, Carpinteria Salt Marsh is one of eight sites statewide with extremely high quality data on coastal bird abundance. And those data can be used to actually look at patterns in the number of species of birds inhabiting the salt marsh and also how frequently those species turn over. And what I mean by that is how frequently we see species disappearing from the marsh or new species appearing in the marsh. And so if you look at those graphs on the top is a graph showing the number of species that have been observed in the marsh from about 2003 through 2022. And that red box indicates an area where the number of species that had been observed actually showed a, a fairly significant decline. And so now we're investigating various hypotheses that could potentially explain that decline. The graph, the lower graph, uh, shows turnover, or this is the change in the actual species that have been observed in the marsh. So new species that have shown up or old species that have disappeared. And you can see along with that decrease in species richness, there was an increase in turnover between 2011 and 2015. And I want to thank Dr. Chris Jurdy for providing these data. Chris is a researcher here at UC Santa Barbara. Now, we conduct several stewardship projects, and here are two of our most recent ones. Um, probably the largest project that we've ever done on the reserve was our culvert replacement project. And this was a project to replace some failing culverts that run underneath the Estero Way extension, the road that extends into the center of the reserve and serves as the primary access point for all of our researchers, students, and public groups. Uh, the culverts do a lot to allow water to circulate from the western portion of the marsh to the eastern portion of the marsh. And so they're critical in providing uh, a mechanism that maintains refunctioning. On the right is a conservation project that we have that's ongoing. And this is to remove populations of a non-native uh, species of European sea lavender, limonium. The sea lavender is shown there on the picture on the right. And on the left is another photo of our salt marsh bird speak. This is the endangered species of salt marsh plant. And the limonium is actually crowding out the bird speak. And so it's critically important that we control and remove the sea lavender in order to protect our bird speak population. And so this is a project that we've partnered with. Um, we have many partners, including Channel Islands Restoration, Tidal Influence, the Upper Salinas Las Tablas Resource Conservation District, the Kachuma Resource Conservation District, the Santa Barbara Botanical Garden, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And the projects received funding from the Wildlife Conservation Board, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Santa Barbara Council of Area Governments. And so I want to thank all of those groups for their funding and all of our partners for all of their help in 
helping to uh, protect the population of salt marsh birds beak within the marsh. And so with that, I'm going to conclude my presentation and I'm going to introduce tonight's main speaker, Ms. Madison Hurd. Maddie received her MF in 2023 from the UC Department of Ecology, Evolution and Marine Biology, where she focused on the ecological physiology of estuarine fishes. She was instrumental in creating the UCSB Undergraduate Research Symposium. And now her research interests focus on the physiological response of marine organisms to environmental stressors related to climate change. Maddie's goals include building community with her research through education and outreach. So I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna turn things over to Maddie. Maddie, take it away. Okay, going to share my screen. All right, um, thank you so much for being here. I'm um, really excited to be talking about my master's research tonight. Um, and before I begin, I just wanted to say I'm just deeply honored to be um, the person representing Carpentry Salt Marsh. Um, I've been a fan of the fall seminar series for about two years now. And so um, I've always wondered, wow, how can I do that? Or wow, I wish that could be me. So I'm really excited to be here doing it. Um, and I also just have um, a big shout out to uh, the people who helped make this work possible. So first, I just have, would love to thank my advisor, Dr. Eric Eliason, um, for just the wise counsel through all, all the years. Uh, and then to my committee members, uh, Gretchen Hoffman and Andy Brooks, thank you so much for your support and um, all your knowledge. Uh, within my lab, uh, there are so many wonderful people who helped um, catch fish, helped train me on techniques that I had no idea um, how to even begin learning. Um, so thank you first to Dr. Emily uh, Hardison, uh, officially Dr. Emily Hardison, and Dr. Gail uh, Schriederman both helped me um, learn the techniques to tr test fish um, and answered my many questions. And um, one of the biggest thank yous uh, to Kate Becker was my undergrad summer intern. Um, we braved 14, 15 plus hour days in uh, the lab throughout the summer. So uh, thank you, Kate, for the emotional support and for taking care of killifish. Um, this all would not have been possible without you. All right. And with that, uh, to finally, let's talk. So first, I'll go through um, just a brief overview. So I'll go through my background and the methods, and I have three questions that I've been looking into. So I'll go through those, and then I'll end on a conclusion and then leave time for some questions at the end. So uh, to start us off, at the core of my talk and my master's research is the concept of variability. Environmental variability is present across all landscapes. Um, for example, in this mountainous region, like the image shown here, this is the Eastern Sierra, uh, Mammoth Lake specifically, this landscape just drastically changes in the winter and has transformed this snow-packed um, and beautiful landscape, uh, which is wildly different than what it looks like in the summer. Bringing that example a bit closer to uh, home for me, uh, the intertidal zone. This uh, region experiences incredible variability in environmental conditions. Uh, in this image, you can see that these tide pools are at low tide and during relatively small swell or surf, but when the tide rises, these swells pick up or these same tranquil tide pools turn into uh, regions that experience rapid and intense wave energy, which is um, a pretty big difference. So thinking about all of these landscapes and comparing them, we can see how variability or changes in the conditions that exist in an environment uh, is an ever-present factor across ecosystems. And a system that I've had the pleasure of working with uh, for this thesis and sees a tremendous amount of change regularly is the Carpentria Salt Marsh UC Reserve. So this UC Reserve is just 20 minutes or down the road from where I'm sitting right now or from where my office is too, um, and is a dynamic system that's characterized by extreme variability because of the tides. And this system is home to many organisms, um, but the group that I'm specifically interested in studying uh, that resides in the marsh are fish because they are cold-blooded or ectothermic, and which means that their internal body temperature is determined by the outside um, temperature and their rate and processes, uh, their uh, internal physio physiology um, are deeply uh, intertwined with the external temperature. 
So going from an aerial view, uh, this is the Carpentria Salt Marsh Deserve. At your top of the screen is the Carpentria um, Civilization or the built up area along with the freeway. And then at the bottom of your screen is the Pacific Ocean. And one of the reason, regions that I've focused a lot of my work on has been this single road because it's easy to access with a car just driving down. Um, but uh, this is one of the places where you can see a drastic change in the marsh pretty easily. So here's a picture I took of this channel that follows that one road down at high tide. You can see that the channel is full to the gills with water at high tide, but as the tide starts to recede, this same channel is virtually drained of water, and which you can imagine presents a challenge for the organisms living within these little channels. Um, some of the changes in environmental conditions we see include changes in salinity, or in general terms, how salty the water is. Uh, we see changes in dissolved oxygen or how much oxygen is available in the water. But one of the factors that I mentioned um, a bit before is temperature. So temperature has a profound effect on the ectotherm or fish function. And understanding the effects uh, these rapid and extreme changes in temperature within the marsh uh, have on the performance of ectotherms can help us better understand the limits of their function. And along with temperature, another factor that's kind of emerging as an important component that may modulate the performance or influence the ability for um, specific parts of the fish or the full fish to function uh, is diet. But uh, why diet? Great question. So why consider diet a factor? Uh, we can think of it from two perspectives. The first is an ecological perspective where these nutritional resources that are within an ecosystem can vary either spatially or temporally. Um, along with the quality and quantity or diet types available. Uh, diet types can vary across the year uh, with some foods being present during the summer months and then some aren't really as reliable during the winter and vice versa. And diet type and quantity can change over time um, on a smaller scale, like high tide versus low tide. And we've also found evidence, it's pretty neat, uh, of the composition or the nutritional value of these diet items um, shifting in warmer temperatures. There's this really neat study from um, some folks at UCSB looking at this in um, giant kelp. So we know that diet changes over time, but we aren't uh, quite sure whether this has an influence when linked with temperature. So being able to um, combine these two factors together and understand if fish are able to meet the needs that they need to, to survive, like swimming, finding food, finding a mate, um, as well as the general demands of life in the marsh um, is pretty critical. And then from a physiological perspective, uh, we can also think of um, on like a deeper level, um, which is where kind of my bread and butter comes in. I'm really interested in ecology. I'm really interested in physiology, uh, hence the field ecological physiology. Um, so one of the reasons why I'm interested in looking at the physiological perspective is because we found that uh, fish reach a limit in their ability to function when the temperature becomes too high. And with recent research on the impact of diet on uh, performance, we found that there may be a link uh, between this. Uh, perhaps the nutrients that are available in a diet may support the response that fish have uh, at these higher temperatures. So instead of their higher or upper thermal limits being um, capped at a certain temperature because of their diet, maybe there's a certain um, nutrient available in their diet that may help them um, meet the demands at a higher temperature and continue their function. So uh, there's also this really uh, interesting um, like addition to this. Uh, we've kind of tried to identify some uh, mechanisms through which we might uh, or fish may be able to meet their demands at higher temperatures or, or tolerate, have a greater thermal tolerance. And there's this um, component called a marine fatty acid. Some of you may know it as fish oil or omega-3 fatty acids that you can get in the store. Um, so we have found some evidence that this may also play a role in supporting performance across temperatures um, and is one of the reasons why I'm interested in combining this temperature and diet um, aspect. So that'll pop up a bit later. So um, essentially, there is this interaction between diet and the variable temperatures, and it's important to consider when uh, trying to understand the overall organismal function, combining these two factors together. And with this deeper knowledge of any interaction between temperature and diet, scientists may be able to find or understand underlying mechanisms that can ultimately support um, or influence a fish's vulnerability uh, as with higher temperatures. Uh, this is particularly useful as we are facing a warming world and the temperatures within this marsh um, are seeing um, peaks higher than have been previously recorded. 
So all of this together, this leads me to my overarching question of how does fluctuating temperatures and diet type affect the performance of the California killifish? So within the system is the small but mighty California killifish. They are schooling fish that experience high thermal variability. They travel all throughout the marsh um, and they meet through, they meet these pockets of warm water and go into cold water and are able to still maintain their function. They also are able to eat a variety of items, which makes them a really neat um, model organism to use for my research. A little bit more about the killifish. Uh, their geographic range is from Morro Bay to Baja, California. Um, so quite large, but comparing them to lots of other killifish who you may have even seen in um, pet stores. They are uh, they have ornate cousins, but uh, these ones are not as ornate. They're quite bland, um, but still nice. Uh, their range is quite narrow. This is the Morro Bay to Baja, California um, killifish. And then their size is about 11 centimeters um, when they're fully grown, which is length of a toilet paper roll. Um, their life history, they are annual fish, although sometimes they can reach uh, two years or three years. Uh, they reach their peak re reproductive season in early summer, uh, and then they're sexually dimorphic, which means that the males and females have different colors when they're um, sexually mature. So females have this a bit more um, muted color, a bit more gray, and when the males um, are, uh, I guess, energetic, <laughs> they turn yellow. Uh, so that helps us identify which species. They also have a bit of a difference in their fins, but for uh, ease of showing the dimorphism, um, PowerPoint has colored this fish yellow. <laughs> hope it uh, hope it helps uh, clear it up. And then uh, for the diet, they're generalist, which means that they're receptive to consuming whatever prey presents itself. Um, they're not picky eaters. So uh, they can eat small plankton, bigger plankton, worms, crustaceans, um, as long as it fits in their mouth. Um, and another fun, interesting fact is that their mouth faces upwards. So a lot of the times they're looking into the water column and up uh, for their food. So California killifish are um, champions of environmental variability. I should have put a crown on this fish, but I ran out of time. Um, they this means that they're just incredibly tolerant to a wide range of conditions, um, including temperature. Uh, and another really neat thing that's also one of the topics I'll be talking about a lot is plasticity. So killifish have this remarkable ability to shift their physiology to function in whatever conditions they find themselves um, to a limit, but um, it is far greater than a lot of species. Uh, so the, the plasticity is essentially this um, plastic state for their internal physiology to shift to meet new conditions and then shift back. So an example of this would be um, killifish's ability to function across temperature during high tide when the water um, comes into the channel and it's about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and then when the tide goes out, uh, they're able to um, meet the same demands and function and live successfully in this new colder temp or warmer temperature as that channel goes out and the water um, temperature increases. So plasticity is a really uh, key factor when considering California killifish or killifish in general. Um, but ultimately, using killifish who have this incredible plasticity, we can better understand the limits of their function and give us insight as to how they might fare in the future. So this brings me to a few uh, specific questions, really um, identifying the things that I wanted to um, look into during this master's. So the first question, I was just looking at temperature and comparing a, a fluctuating temperature versus a static temperature. Um, I the specific, so the specific question was how do fluctuating acclimations affect performance compared to static acclimations? Um, acclimation is just a fancy word for treatment. So um, I anticipated finding that the temperatures where uh, treatments with um, fluctuating treatments will uh, increase performance compared to their static counterparts. Um, so the foundation of this question is also um, trying to dig into the importance of fluctuating temperatures, which is more um, ecologically relevant versus static temperatures. Um, previous research has really focused on static temperatures being used in lab conditions because it's um, easier to hold fish at a static temperature. Um, and because of infrastructure and logistics, it is um, really convenient um, and helpful to get a baseline understanding of how organisms respond to temperature at a static level. But um, I'm really interested in this more ecologically um, relevant perspective. So uh, my first order of business was to see if there was a difference between static and fluctuating treatments. 
My next question was looking at um, diet and temperature together. Uh, here, I was looking to broad diets versus a single item or a simple diet. Um, here, I hypothesized that a well-rounded and uh, diet with like a broader nutrient assemblage, like this broad diet, would uh, better support performance compared to a simple diet where only one food item was available. And then my last question was, how do upper thermal limits vary when tested at the trough uh, or the lowest temperature of the experience versus peak or the highest temperature of the experience uh, throughout their fluctuating acclimation cycle or throughout the fluctuating treatment? Uh, here, I hypothesize that with the broader diet, um, this would lend um, support to the physiology. And so a broader diet would do uh, have better performance or um, there would be evidence of better performance compared to simple diets where this only one food item was available. There's a lot of questions here. Uh, so I'll focus on the first one uh, and looking just at our fluctuating and static temperatures. Here is a... Um, fun <laughs> graph that I drew. I'm so sorry, it doesn't look too uh, professional, but um, what I was looking at here is essentially trying to showcase the static versus fluctuating groups. Uh, this, um, the solid line is uh, static and you can see that it might be a bit shorter compared to its fluctuating um, counterpart. And that range that um, the beginning to the end of this line is um, essentially thermal breadth, which I'll define everything in a bit. Um, but let's get into the methods of how I tested this. So first, uh, it was the wet lab setup. Um, I tried to create a system where I was essentially simulating the intertidal uh, within my tanks and is way harder than it sounds. Um, luckily, I went into my master's looking to learn how to do this specifically. So um, that was a dream come true, kind of. It took about three months of trial and error. Uh, I did not get shocked at all because there's a lot of electricity needed to do this. I maxed out the wet lab system. Thank goodness nothing went wrong. Um, and once the system was up and running, uh, then came time to go to the field and collect these fish that I was after. So I headed back to the marsh where I began to set up these minnow traps um, that I had or um, some sort of um, one of the traps that I had used. Uh, I found my first site really along this killifish highway that I've dubbed. I don't know if that, that name will stick. Um, Andy, I'll talk to you in five years to see if it's still around, but um, this is my main collection uh, region at first, and the techniques that I used were um, essentially two uh, types. So we had minnow traps and seines. For minnow traps, it was the first technique I used because it was essentially easier to do um, a bit more solo, uh, so I could go out on my own whenever the tides worked for, with me, and it was a bit more um, I guess, easier to, to go and catch fish in a more effective way. Um, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Uh, so minnow traps essentially are a way to collect fish passively um, in the environment like carp, uh, this carp salt marsh. Uh, the tides change rapidly. So this was really helpful when I um, had to wade out into the middle of the channel. If it was low tide, I could walk out easily, place the trap, and then let the tide come in. Um, and then just avoid being there at high tide where I'd have to swim to go get the traps. Um, so there was some fun um, challenges associated with this trap. Here is a picture of me on day one of catching fish uh, and year one of grad school, bright eyed and bushy tailed. I was also beaming after setting up my first ever minnow trap, um, this one here, uh, but spoiler alert, caught zero fish, <laughs> which is how it goes. Um, if they called it fishing or if they called it catching, no, what's the My advisor told me this in my darkest moments. I think she said if catching fish was easy, they'd call it catching instead of fishing, something like that, which is very helpful. Um, so to describe the minnow trap a bit more, um, in case you haven't seen one before, I hadn't before this uh, master's. So it's this um, trap that's split in two and they join together in the center. And there's a narrow opening on both sides. Um, you um, often hang fish and or bait in the center. Um, and the goal here is to have, um, I guess, fish that can fit in or any organism really that can fit into those holes enter, um, lured by uh, whatever smells are emanating from this minnow trap, uh, and then have a hard time getting out. So here's another picture of them. Um, my bait was frozen squid, which um, smells great. Um, and it's great for the killifish, or so I thought. <laughs> so um, I would bait these and hang them in the center. And the goal here was to have them 
um, be hanging um, and I guess the beta trap when it's underwater, it would be flowing um, or floating in the center. Um, California killifish ideally would pick up the scent and enter. Uh, once they are inside, they don't have the ability to eve leave as easily. Um, but uh, this was one of the best ways to introduce myself to catching fish in the marsh and really see what I was up against. Uh, killifish are uh, very elusive um, at times. So after a month of trial and error um, and having caught 60 fish out of 362 and needing to start my experiment, um, we switched gears and tried a different approach, uh, enter seining. So we headed over to the main channel where this uh, this first bend um, from the open ocean, it has its first bend and then goes down the killifish highway. Uh, there's more water movement here. So I was hoping that this would be where our luck would pick up. Um, for seining, we had a larger team. Um, I think a minimum seven people were needed. So it was a bit more logistically challenging to go out as a large group um, and go seining. So um, we were at the point where I needed the fish and I'm so thankful for all the people who came out to help. Um, so the SANES work in a more of a team effort way than where we have one part of the group called the net group, uh, pictured here, uh, is wades through the channel and sets up or holds this net until they reach the other side. And you can see here that there's a float line at the top um, to keep the net at the surface. And then underwater, it's hard to see because I didn't take a picture underwater, but you'll have to trust me. There's weights down there. Um, the weights essentially um, are keeping contact with the bottom so no fish can go under and no fish can go over is the goal. Uh, and then we have another team um, that's stationed a bit further up the channel after the group of fish that we're looking to catch. Um, this is called the scare team, lovingly termed scare team. Um, and their goal was to uh, start making forward movement towards the net um, with the nets trying to, like, I guess, create a barrier. It's pretty comical when it actually uh, is happening and oftentimes fish go the opposite way, which is, it's called fishing, not catching. <laughs> so this is a picture of us merging together. We have the net kind of being pulled towards the shore and the goal is to um, get the net to a place where there's not enough water for fish to leap out. Um, I also would like to thank the SBC field, SBCC field course uh, for their support while we were testing out field methods. Um, we spent a day in the marsh teaching students how to do field work in the marsh and how this um, fun environment works uh, and tested out a few methods that um, I ultimately implemented in my master's research. Um, it was um, also around this time that I would like to give a shout out to um, the one and only Andy Brooks who is a certified fish whisperer. Uh, he came at the 11th hour and helped me catch the remaining 150-ish fish that I needed to begin my experiment on time. Um, to say this thesis would not have turned out uh, the way it did uh, is an understatement. <laughs> so thank you, Andy. So once we caught the fish and we brought them back to uh, the wet lab, or I guess there was a bit more before that, we had to um, sift through them. Um, it was also around this time where I employed the technologically advanced tool known as a bucket. And I also found out just how hard it is to unstack buckets when they're wet and stacked together. Um, but once I did unstack these buckets, I then sorted killifish in them. Uh, here's a picture of me finally catching all the fish. You can see it, a small smile because I caught all the fish after like four months of trying. Um, so we sorted them, counted them all, made sure we didn't have more than we needed, let um, the rest of the fish that were caught throughout this method that we, or the seining method that we used, um, put them back into um, the channel and headed back to the wet lab. So when we brought them back to the wet lab, this is a picture of me also so happy to have fish. Um, we started preparing them for life in the wet lab. So this is called an acclimation period. Uh, or a quarantine period is also um, a word that people use for it. This essentially allows fish to adjust their new environment and return back to baseline levels of stress. Um, just like humans, when we move from one house to another, um, we actually move all of our gear and settle into a new place. It can be really stressful. Um, same goes for fish. So giving fish at least three days to settle into their new tanks, um, their new different um, water makeup, just um, adjusting to their environment helps them settle in and then make sure that 
the test that I'm running isn't confounded by any um, lingering stress. So we're starting from baseline, essentially, by giving them this quarantine period to settle into their new home. So after the three-day quarantine period, um, we then began the acclimation or um, started exposing our fish to treatments. Um, this was about a three-week long acclimation period. And to determine the temperatures that I used for my treatments, uh, we collected temperature data in the marsh for about two years. When I say we, I mean a previous PhD student, Krista Kraskara, uh, now Dr. Krista Kraskara. Uh, she had headed out to the marsh way before my time with a temperature logger like this one you see here uh, and place them all throughout the marsh in different pockets. Um, we were hoping to get a, a good representation of um, different types of channels or streams or inlets um, that are around the marsh. And then with all of this information and having left them out for two years, I took them back. Actually, I did go find them. Um, I think Andy, there's one still left in there collecting data. <laughs> it's probably under a lot of mud. Um, I'll get it one day. So uh, with the loggers that we had then um, collected, we created some plots. So here are some temperature um, graphs from those data. We have, it's an average daily maximum and minimum temperatures that we've collected over two years. So on the x-axis is month, and these panels are um, 2019, 2020, and 2021. And on the y-axis is temperature. So we have these um, blue boxes on the bottom representing our average monthly minimum temperatures that were collected at the, each month. And then the red represents the average monthly, monthly maximum. And what we see here is just this trend of seasonality that's emerging. So we have in the winter months, we see colder ranges of temperatures. Summer months, we see higher ranges of temperatures, which makes sense. Um, but it was really helpful for us to see this um, massive display of temperatures and the wide range of temperatures that killifish experience. So using this spread, I strategically selected representative temperatures, um, like an average representative temperature for colder side of temperatures experienced, uh, middle and the warmer. So these lines represent those averages for uh, the blue one is representing the colder range, the purple is representing the middle range, and the warmer uh, red color is on the warmer side of things. This is around 11 degrees Celsius, 20 and 29. On a shorter time scale, this plot shows fluctuating temperatures over about one week, and we can see here that this range of temperature um, fluctuates wildly, and the amplitude um, of each temperature um, changes across days but it's not uncommon for these fluctuations we see here to reach about 10 degrees Celsius, sometimes even more. Um, so knowing that this type of fluctuation is present in the marsh, I was able to create these, these temperature treatments that um, aim to accurately represent uh, the regime seen in the marsh. So first we have our three static temperature treatments. Uh, this represents the average lower, middle and upper end of temperatures. And then we have the fluctuating temperatures that are added to the mix. We have an 11 to 20 degrees Celsius fluctuating, which re represents the colder um, temperatures and 20 to 29 representing the warmer temperatures. In total, this gives us five temperature treatments. Um, and then again, this is supposed to hopefully serve as the um, reflection of seasonal variation that we found in the marsh. So after acclimating our fish for three weeks, then came time to test them. Uh, for this work, I focus on the heart. Um, so why I focus on the heart? Great question. Uh, it is important for transportation. So we have um, the heart transports oxygen, nutrients, waste products, um, when they, you name it. Uh, then we have uh, also found evidence that it's one of the first organ systems to fail at higher temperatures. We've also found that uh, there is more clarity compared to common whole body performance tests, which is uh, the norm usually when it comes to understanding thermal tolerance. And lastly, it's a good measure for understanding how fish will handle thermal stress because it is a more ecologically relevant metric. Um, it tells us when the first sign of failure begins. To test our, our fish uh, was um, very interesting. Uh, here is a picture of my fish set up um, in this sort of EKGs, similar to the ones that we use when we go to a doctor. Um, these fish are anesthetized in a bath of water, do not feel anything. And then I pharmacologically isolated heart function, which is a fancy way of saying I um, wanted to just uh, focus on heart function and uh, brain and brain's connection to the heart was completely severed um, chemically. So the heart was functioning in isolation. Then I introduced a drug that allowed it to be at maximum capacity. 
Um, so it's essentially putting the, your foot to the pedal to the metal and the heart was beating at, cap at capacity. When plotted on a graph, it looks something like this. We have temperature on the X axis and on the Y axis is maximum heart rate. We see as temperature increases, so does maximum heart rate up to a point, And then there's a steady decline. Uh, this decline is marked by an arrhythmia or what we see as T fail. And this snapshot shows an arrhythmia um, on the test that I ran. So to describe this curve there and compare it across treatments, there are different metrics that we can pull from this. Uh, one of them is T fail or the T failure. Um, I will also introduce a few more. The first one is TABT uh, or simply the temperature at which this exponential increase in heart rate first begins to slow. It's that first um, line of, of decline. Next, we have T-peak, which is the temperature at which the heart is at peak performance, uh, although this is, may not necessarily represent the best temperature for fish because any further increase in temperature will result in a declining heart rate. Uh, so it's a slippery slope towards complete heart failure. And another metric that focuses on the actual performance uh, is the uh, peak heart rate that corresponds to this maximum heart rate. So for this first question, what did I find? Uh, first, looking at just peak maximum heart rate, uh, we have on the x-axis is acclimation temperature or treatment, and on the y-axis is these maximum heart rates. First is a static group. So we see that this is the steady incline in maximum heart rate with temperature, which is completely normal and what we expected to find when we tested our fish. But what I wanted to really point out was our fluctuating groups. So adding fluctuating groups into the mix, we see this similar plateau that we were seeing this trend in where um, for the fluctuating groups beyond 11 to 20, uh, it joins this, uh, the warmer end of my treatments. And we essentially see that there is um, the trend emerging here. And the key takeaway is that heart rate essentially cannot increase after 20 degrees Celsius. So you see this thermal ceiling of sorts. Um, it's very interesting given that this marsh um, experiences temperatures over 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and then we also, um, I found evidence here that the 11 to 20 group does have this ability for plasticity, which um, is not present in the warmer um, temperatures. Looking at the upper thermal limits or the temperature um, metrics, we have the TABT, TPEAK, and TFAIL, um, and the, you can find those on the graph to the right. So here showing first this um, TABT or the temperature at which the heart rate first begins to slow down. Uh, we did not have it for the 29 static group because this temperature or the treatment was above this temperature. Adding in T fail, we see the similar trend of increasing um, temperature with increasing acclimation. Adding T fail to it, um, we see again the similar trend. And these are just the static data. Adding fluctuating treatments to the mix, we see an interesting trend emerge, which is probably one of my favorite findings, and I really enjoyed looking into this. So circling this, we find that for fluctuating groups, the upper thermal limits seem to follow a different pattern compared to the static groups. And looking into these data a bit more, we can use a new metric to describe what we're seeing here, which is that thermal breadth that I referenced a bit earlier. So thermal breadth is essentially the distance between thermal limits. And for this talk, I'll be focusing on the temperature which fish started at and the temperature at which their heart failed. Here is this plot that I produced from the thermal breadth data that I collected. And the main takeaway here is essentially the fluctuating temperatures have a broader thermal performance, um, which is really interesting. Um, and I have enjoyed digging into this so much. Um, we do find evidence here that uh, it is confirming what we were considering um, being with the fluctuating groups. We anticipated finding this broader thermal performance in fluctuating groups compared to static, but it is exciting to see this confirmation in my data. So question one showed interesting trends, and I realized I think I'm a bit short on time, so I'm going to quickly go for it a little bit faster. Um, everything is uh, already explained. So uh, looking into data now, do broad diets improve performance compared to simple diets? And here is just a quick schematic of this hypothesis. Essentially, I was hypothesizing that a broad diet would improve performance compared to a simple diet, which is that um, dotted line having a greater peak compared to that solid line. The diet treatments I used were uh, two of them, solo versus broad. For the first treatment, I had a, a diet of only brine shrimp, um, delicious. For the broad diet, I had brine shrimp along with bloodworms and arctic copepods. 
uh, which is um, the marine food resource or the marine food source for this broad diet. And they contain that marine fatty acid or the omega-3s uh, slash fish oil that I mentioned earlier. So I was anticipating finding the broad diet having this benefit uh, to performance compared to the solo. So um, looking into now the treatments, I applied these two diets to the fluctuating regime for the colder as well as the warmer. So just the fluctuating groups were used for this. I um, also wanted to get at that seasonality present. I acclimated them for three weeks and tested them in the same way I did before. And again, showing you some data. So here we have just that heart function or peak maximum heart rate. On the x-axis, we have diet. And on the y-axis is maximum heart rate. And these panels are split between the colder regime and the warmer regime. So first, I'll actually, I think this is showing everything, which is um, exciting. So here we see a star, which is always um, fun to look at. Uh, it means something's happening. Uh, so we do see some, some evidence of an effect of diet. Um, however, to my surprise and the surprise of my lab mates, we found actually the opposite of what I was hypothesizing. So what we're seeing here in the 11 to 20 uh, colder fluctuating regime panel is the um, solo diet outperforming the broad diet, which is opposite of what I was hypothesizing. Um, still scratching my brain about this, which is leaves room for really exciting information to dig into or more research questions. So the key takeaway here, and uh, the most important thing that I found from this um, section is that a broad diet essentially reduced the ability for the heart to perform at cold temperatures. It's so interesting. Um, looking at now the other metrics, the cardiac upper thermal limits, uh, we do see some interesting results too. First, I'm showing you um, information just from the single diet. And these are, again, those um, temperature metrics. Adding in our broad diet to the mix, we do see this still this trend of the broad diet in the colder treatment having the reduced capacity. So the same finding here, we find that broad diet reduces um, thermal tolerance um, when fed or in a colder regime. So going to this question, do broad, broad diets improve performance compared to simple diets? Well, uh, no, <laughs> we found the opposite, um, but that means that there's room for um, some interesting research questions. Now onto the very last question, where I looked at uh, the timing um, and how the upper thermal limits and performance vary across a tidal cycle, uh, with fish being tested at their peak temperatures versus their lowest or the trough temperatures. We acclimated them for three weeks, tested them um, in the same way. And then for acclimation, we also um, used just a fluctuating group. But for this one, it was just the colder regime um, because there were some interesting trends found in the colder regime. So just focusing on the cold. Uh, I had about six to eight fish for the peak temperatures or the highest temperature they experience, and then the trough temperatures. And the time difference between these two points is about six hours, which is pretty quick. Um, so left them in their treatments for uh, three weeks, tested them the same way I did before, and generated some interesting data. So to orient you to this plot, on the x-axis is the testing time point, and on the y-axis is maximum heart rate. And uh, we have on the right panel, there's the um, schematic of time point. So the blue is the peak and yellow is the trough. And these panels represent our broad diet on the left and a single item diet on the right. Uh, here we have some other interesting trends. Uh, so we see that peak temperatures in the blue and the yellow uh, represent the trough. We have this interesting trend. Uh, we see like a, a difference essentially emerging in this broad panel, the um, one panel on your left. So it looks like our peak um, and trough do um, look to be different, um, but uh, comparing this to the single item diet, uh, there is no difference. But uh, what I wanted to point out here is that uh, there seems to be this tremendous um, ability for plasticity in the broad diet compared to a simple item diet, um, which is exciting um, and exciting to look into. Um, so the main takeaway here is that there is this greater plasticity when fish are fed um, a diet that has more nutrients to lend to those responses for fish to deal with these new conditions. So interesting. <laughs> so interesting. Looking at the cardiac upper thermal limits, uh, we have this panel split in the same way. And adding in my first is the trough, so the lowest temperature they experience. And again, for the peak, we 
do see that the similar trend of the broad diet treatment supporting this greater plasticity uh, when they're fed a broad diet. Very interesting. So the key takeaway I want you to know for this is that there is greater plasticity in the broad diet treatments. Amazing. So going back to these questions that we had, uh, do upper thermal limits vary at the trough versus peak of their um, acclimation cycle? We found that, yes, there was a difference when tested at the peak versus trough in the broad diet when they had nutrients available. Um, so going back to all of these questions, we can now think of things from a different perspective and perhaps adjust the second question, because while no, we did not find broad diet improving cardiac performance, um, the actual performance or beating of the heart, we did see that the heart was able to restructure itself across a six hour time span to meet demands when they're in this new temperature and the broad diet supported that change. So um, really interesting to see things from a different perspective. All right. Now to wrap us up, uh, we have implications or the conclusions of this talk. Uh, my first hypothesis, um, looking at these static versus fluctuating temperatures, did killifish uh, see, a, or yes, <laughs> killifish did see a performance or uh, limit in their performance when they were at a commonly experienced temperature. Um, they essentially found their thermal ceiling at 20 degrees Celsius. Um, this fish is a champion of environmental variability and experiences temperatures of at least up to 35 degrees Celsius. Um, so this is a pretty interesting finding that we found th there was no um, ability for the heart to um, increase its performance after 20 degrees Celsius. And there's no little to no plasticity for the heart to perform um, at the higher end either. So this suggests ultimately that there's less ability for these killifish to effectively respond to the demands of life in the marsh at temperatures in the system when they continue to rise above these peaks that are above their thermal ceiling. Um, next, looking at my second hypothesis, diet and temperature, we did found, uh, we found evidence that there uh, is an, an, an effect of diet um, on the upper thermal limits of the heart. Uh, so this study is important because not much has been done looking at the interaction between temperature and diet. So it's been an honor to uh, look into this and um, hopefully spark some new research questions that uh, will be pretty interesting to read about in the future. And lastly, uh, testing across fluctuations. So we did find this really interesting um, thing where a, when fish are fed a broad diet or they have a greater assemblage of nutrients available to them, killifish can um, rapidly uh, change their physiology to meet demands of life in the marsh, um, which is just astounding. Uh, so um, it's, yeah, it's been a joy to look into all of this information or look into this question and killifish have my whole heart now. Um, Lastly, I'd like to thank my funding sources because without their support, I would not have been able to do this remotely at all. Um, so thank you so much for not only supporting me, but for the undergraduate that um, helped me do all of this work. Um, and thank you for listening, or thanks. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, it's just now eight o'clock, but we can stay okay. on for just a little bit longer if people have any questions. We have one question. Do you think a single diet of a food other than brine shrimp would replicate the results? That's a great question. Um, I would be interested in looking into it. I know that brine shrimp are a pretty um, common food item for them, but looking into maybe other items um, that might have a different nutrient profile um, that might yield different results. I haven't um, had the chance to look into the composition um, further. So um, if I did a PhD, I would definitely look into um, how different diets stack up. Okay. I, I actually have a question and that's that the second and third components of your research both indicated that at the lower temperatures, the single diet actually conferred more benefits than the mixed diet. Mm -hmm. At high temperatures, it, it all kind of came out to be the same, but at lower mm -hmm. temperatures, the single diet seemed to be better than the mix. Do you have any idea why that might be? Um, one of the ideas that I have is that it, the um, digestive like physiology or the way that our, the fish were able to process the food is much more efficient when it's just one item present. So less energy is lended to digest different, maybe crunchy items or items that are fibrous or um, just not really easy to process. So um, less energy is spent on digestion uh, and more on um, the heart 
uh, that's one of the thoughts that I have, but um, yeah, it's still, it is in my mind, I'm like, why? <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I, I found really interesting, Maddie, was uh, a lot of times when we hear research presentations, we hear very little about the methods that are used. The, you know, the, the presenter will just say something like, oh, I went out and, and caught fish, and then I did this experiment. Here are the results. I think your presentation very much illustrated uh, the difficulties in doing research and the fact that when you're doing uh, research at the master's or PhD level, uh, often you're inventing the methods as you go along and certainly uh, things don't always go right. And it's actually a lot of, of work and, and thought that goes into designing these experiments. Um, and so I think you you illustrated that really well. We have a couple more questions. Um, one uh, from Frank Davis, are there thermal microrefugia that might buffer the extreme thermal fluctuations in the carpentry of salt marsh? And do killifish use them? Um, I feel like we both might be able to answer this, Andy. I um, There are thermal refugia. Uh, there's larger pools that they can um, head to or um, holes from mudsuckers that also offer a bit of thermal refugia um, or just shade in general, um, but they are pretty migratory, so they are able to to leave regions um, and head to places that might be more favorable. Yep, I I would have said the exact same thing. <laughs> yes. um, another question from Wayne Farron: How does the diet fed the fish in the wet lab compare with the natural diet in the marsh? Yeah, great question. Um, my goal was to mimic the diet seen in the marsh. So looking at previous studies on um, killifish diets and other types of um, like small prey available in the marsh, I tried to line up the items that I had. So I had um, some worms present. The blood worms are polychaetes or representative of polychaetes. Um, there's plankton available in the marsh that often serve as prey item. Um, so I had the Arctic copepods, um, which served as this plankton slash crunchy fibrous maybe not necessarily full of nutrients unit, but had the marine fatty acids and then brine shrimp as well to kind of connect it um, to the simple item diet, um, as well as having these shrimp-like critters available in the marsh too. Right. Okay, I think that's all the questions that we have. I wanna thank everyone for attending tonight's webinar. Um, please join us next Wednesday night when we'll visit the Rancho Marino Reserve up in Cambria to hear all about sea otters. Cool. Uh, and so there have been several uh, questions about, is this being recorded? And the answer is uh, most of it. <laughs> I'm still getting used to moderating these things and I forgot to start the recording. So I will record my portion and splice that into Maddie's portion. And then the entire presentation will be posted to the UCSB NRS YouTube channel. So I'm gonna thank Maddie uh, for an excellent job. And I am gonna put another slide on the screen that will have some more information uh, about websites that you can visit if you're interested in getting more information on the UC Natural Reserve System as a whole, on the UCSB managed NRS reserves, so the seven reserves that are administered by UCSB. Um, and I've also pasted in uh, the address of the UCSB NRS YouTube channel. So uh, everyone, please join with me in congratulating Maddie and thanking her for a wonderful seminar. And I'm gonna say good night and I will leave this slide up for the next two or three minutes if people wanna do a screen capture or uh, try to scribble it down. Okay, thank you and um, good night. Thanks, Andy.